Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Monday, April 2nd, 2018. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live to tape steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, one of our famous on vacation shows, yet it's like we're not on vacation. We've pre-worked. So the show is for reals today. On the program, Ijeomu Alu, uh, she is the author of So You Want to Talk About Race. Fascinating uh, book. Helpful for um, for white folk in particular uh, who want to uh, talk about race in this uh, day and age. And um, yeah, I know, I know, race was never an issue in this country not until very recently. Very recent. I mean, yes, there was a little bit of that race stuff back in the day, and then after that day, and then following that day. There was some, but then it was like there was nothing. And now it's all like white, black, this, white people, this, black people, that. It's amazing how racialized our society has been. Uh, Of course, I'm uh, joking. Um, But that is what, I mean, every day we hear someone on the right talk about like, oh, how come all of a sudden it's all about race? Get those white guys. Get them. Get them. There you go. Um But in fact, I think um, if you were not a member of the race that has been the um, who's been winning the race wars (laughs) (laughs) since day one, you may not even be aware of the uh, of 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 what's going on about race in this country. Um, So check it out. We, of course, are on vacation uh, this week. And I'll tell you one thing I'm probably doing. I'm probably sitting at home admiring my blinds. (laughs) Yeah, window treatments is one of those soulless adulting terms for something necessary but boring as hell. You're you're blinds. You don't even think about them unless they move, unless you move or they break or I don't know. You suddenly realize like, wait a second, people can see into my apartment. When they're right, everything in your home looks better. When they're wrong, everything looks like garbage. But let's be honest, taking the time to pick out and buy blinds sounds expensive, incredibly boring. Installing them, if you're someone like Michael, sounds like something that is completely impossible to do. And if you're someone like Michael, maybe, maybe, maybe he may be the only person. But blinds.com makes it super easy. If you're not sure what you want or even where to start, Blinds.com, they give you a free online design consultation. You send them pictures of your house or your apartment. They send back custom recommendations from a professional that will work with your color scheme, work with your furniture, your style, whatever, specific rooms. They'll even send you free samples to make sure everything looks as good in person as it does online and your order gets free shipping. Free shipping, folks. This is the best part. If you're like Michael and you accidentally mismeasure or you pick the wrong color, if you screw up, Blinds.com will remake your blinds for free. They've made it super easy for you. There's no excuse to leave those mangled, ridiculous, or that sheet that you might have hanging in your room, Matt. Yeah. Two nails and a sheet. That's just not going to cut it at one point, buddy. I do have a headboard now, though. For a limited time, you get up to 20% off of everything at Blinds.com when you use the promo code MAJORITY. That's Blinds.com, promo code MAJORITY for up to 20% off of everything. Faux wood blinds, cellular shades, roller shades, more, all of it. Blinds.com, promo code MAJORITY. Rules and restrictions apply. All right, folks, let me tell you what's on my mind right now. Honestly, I had this last night. I'm pre-taping this, so I would, it would have been Thursday night. As you know, I've been getting Blue Apron from since way before uh, they became a, a sponsor on this show. That is more or less an, a coincidence. Last night, I had, and it, I had it leftovers because I had to go do Hayes, and I came back, I grabbed this. You ready? 
shrimp with these like pasta. I don't know what they're called. I, I, I didn't look at it. They're round like pasta, like sort of like gnocchi, but flattened. I'm telling you, so delicious. I think it could be my favorite Blue Apron meal. I still taste it. I ate all of it. I ate way more than I should have. But Blue Apron, it, the food is delicious. It's the leading meal kit delivery service in the U.S. Many people know what Blue Apron does, but you don't know the types of meals you can eat when you cook Blue Apron. Like popcorn chicken with sweet chili cabbage slaw and cumin spice wonton noodles with vegetable and peanuts. They have incredible ingredients, chef-designed recipes. It lets you see the power of what food can do. It delivers fresh, pre-proportioned ingredients, step-by-step recipes. The, they all can be cooked in under 45 minutes. The menu changes every week. They offer 12 new recipes. You can pick two, three, or four recipes based on, um, on your schedule. We get, to, we get it twice a week. I mean, the, for me, that shrimp thing I think we've had, we, I've had Blue Apron now for, I feel like, three years. The shrimp thing, I think we've had probably four times. They rotate the stuff. But I will tell you this right now. If I could have that twice a week, I would do it. That sounds very good. It is so good. And I'd forgotten about it. There's a lot of, there's a lot of like, sort of like Asian fusion stuff and pasta stuff and then fish. Um, sometimes you get like fried, like fish and chips, but not, it's, you know, you, you deep, you don't deep fry it. You, they give you, I, I, I. the food that we've made has been exceptional and we keep a stack of all the menus. Now I get, a, I mean, not the menus, the recipes. I, I, I'm not hundred percent sure why we do that. But you can keep all the recipes. You can make it yourself. But it's so easy. Uh, it shows up in uh, a box, and it stays fresh. We put it in the fridge, and then we make it uh, twice a week. And, and if, like, we don't do it on Tuesday and Wednesday night, we need it for Thursday, Friday. Sometimes we do Friday, Saturday. Sometimes Sunday. Stuff lasts for uh, at least a week. We And the portions are the perfect size. And it's extremely reasonably priced. Much cheaper than going out for food. Blue Apron is treating Majority Report listeners to 30 bucks off your first order if you visit blueapron.com slash majority. Check out this week's menu. Get your 30 bucks off at blueapron.com slash majority. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Lastly, folks, after you eat, what do you got to do before you go to bed? Brush your teeth. Honestly, like... This is we're so in my wheelhouse right now. It's unbelievable. When it comes to your health, brushing your teeth is one of the most important parts of your day. I have drummed this into my kids. And I have to say, I've done a very good job with Saul. Mila, a little bit less so. But Saul gets it. You got to brush your teeth. It's not just and it really it's secondarily about your breath. The bottom line is when you get to be my age, you start to realize like, oh, my God, this is it. Everything, all those dumb decisions I made 30 years ago, 40 years ago, coming back to bite me in the ass. So a couple of years ago, I got completely obsessed about making sure that I was brushing my teeth as well as I possibly could. And Quip is an awesome new electric toothbrush that packs the right amount of vibrations. But here's the, the key. It's in a slimmer design. It makes it so much easier to, to, to use it. And that is the key with these. With Quip, guiding pulses alert you when to switch sides, making brushing the right amount super easy. It comes with a, a, a mount that sucks right onto your mirror. It can be used as a cover for a hygienic travel anywhere. It fits in most of your like normal uh, toothbrush holders. So you don't need to have like a huge contraption on, on your uh, tiny little sink like we have. And Quip's subscription plan refreshes your brush you're supposed to do this every three months. That's what every dentist will tell you for just five bucks, including free shipping uh, worldwide. I've got my sister's quip. I got my parents' quip. 
It's backed by a network of over 10,000 dental professionals. It was named one of Time Magazine's best inventions of the year. Find out yourself why. It starts at just 25 bucks, and if you go to getquip.com slash majority right now, you're going to get your first refill pack free with a Quip electric toothbrush. That's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash majority. Get Quip, G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash majority. Check it out. Honestly, take care of your teeth. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Just a reminder also, justcoffee.coop is having a 30% sale. You don't even need to use a coupon code this month. Go check it out, justcoffee.coop. If you wanted to try the MR blend, if you wanted to try it, you want to get a um, five-pound bag, do it, justcoffee.coop. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back to talk about the book so you want to talk about race we are back sam cedar on the majority report on the phone it is a pleasure to welcome to the program the editor at large of the establishment Ijeoma Olou, and she is the author of so you want to talk about race Ijeoma, welcome to the program thanks for having me all right. So um, your book is a, uh, I guess, a a culmination of almost uh, it came right out of your lived experience in having to answer uh, a lot of questions about race. Um, what uh, I mean, let's just talk a little bit about just, you know, sort of your background uh, that, you, that you go through in the introduction, uh, but also um, how you came to write the book. Yeah, sure. So I am a a mixed race black woman um, who was raised in the Seattle area, and I live there still. I'm a parent of two boys. And I kind of grew up always aware of race. I was for a long time, you know, the only black person or one of the only black people in any room. Seattle's a very, very white area. And race was always kind of a big part of my life. You know, I always stood out and there was always a reason why that people either were or were not willing to talk about. And of course, as I got older and I started to understand all of the different ways with which our racial constructs um, were impacting my life, it became something that I discovered I really had to talk about with more meaning and you know, really had to try to get my community to move forward with me on. And so from that, I actually started writing, and from there, came to this book. And and um, your uh, your experience growing up not only I think um, gave you a uh, perhaps I, I know a totally unique but a, but a fairly unique uh, perspective on race um, as 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 being someone of of mixed race, um, and also you. You went through, it appears, enough economic deprivation to have a sense of, of, of where uh, class also intersects with race. And I should obviously, obviously gender as well. But, um, but, but talk about that a little bit before we, we go into some of the, the things that you answer, essentially, uh, or, or, or help with in the book. Yeah, we grew up extremely poor. My mom was a single parent of two kids, and then when I was older, a third child. And, you know, we had no electricity. We had no phone. At times, we slept in cars. We ate at churches, you know, regular food bank members, um, regularly using government programs and going through, you know, that entire process over and over again. So that was kind of normal for me um, for all of my childhood and my early adulthood as well. So I was very aware of what poverty felt like and the humiliation that went along with it, um, but also what it felt like to be seen as poor and black and the difference that went along with that as well. And of course, watching my mom as a single mother um, to see how diffic- how much more difficult things are made for women as well. Um, that was my reality in, in life. Well, I mean, talk about the what, what, the the difference between being uh, poor and poor and black. I mean, where does that um, where does that, from your perspective, where does the um, the 
what is the interplay between um, uh, class and race? And, 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 and I mean, if you want to answer gender as well, because it's another question I want to ask in that regard. But where is where is where is the intersection? How does one uh, and, and does one need to parse that? I think. Uh, we need to parse it in a couple of different ways. There are definitely some universals. I do not think that um, American, the United States culture in general is kind to poor people at all. Um, our society really loves to demonize poor people, to shame poor people, and to really make poor people feel bad. When you're poor and black, there's the expectation that you will be poor and you'll be poor forever. Um, and there's an added invisibility. You know, any empathy or sympathy that can be found for poor people is almost never given to poor black people and other poor people of color. Um, further, there's an added element of criminality that's assumed. You know, we looked poor and we were black. And that meant that, you know, everywhere we went, we were kind of followed around every store we went to. A lot of people thought we were perhaps trying to scam different systems. You know, there was an assumption about our intelligence that was often made as well, uh, because we were both poor and black. And to try to convince people that we had something to offer to society was very tough. There was also a huge difference I noticed too. And, you know, my mom would go and try and get help and people would be incredibly receptive to her. And then, you know, she would bring us. And that reception would definitely change because my mom is white. And being a poor white mom, you know, was something that people felt some sympathy towards. But being a poor white mom of black children suddenly became far less sympathetic. And, you know, my mom would notice, especially when she would take us to, say, to, you know, get free dental care the way that she would be treated when she got hers and then she would bring us and suddenly everything would be cold. And, you know, it had real effects where for a while she wasn't taking us to the dentist because she just couldn't stand that heartbreak and know that, you know, people were thinking these awful things because of her beautiful children. And we have, we have the teeth to show it too as a family. Um, you know, and it's, it's, you know, those things that people don't understand, which is that there are universals and then these additional oppressions as you add them on, these additional classifications that society has, they add to the negative impact and kind of tweak it in different ways and add additional flavors to all of the ways in which, you know, society can confine to kind of beat you down. And we had a quite the combination in our house. And, and all right, so uh, let's let's go into uh, some of these questions, because um, I mean, I think the uh, the the thesis of uh, of your book, uh, if if I may, I think is that um, there is that, and, and I think the, our audience is sort of familiar with this concept to a certain extent, that um, we're living in a uh, society that is uh, inherently white supremacist. And uh, we are all, um, a, you know, playing into that uh, system. And uh, so we all share, I don't know if culpability is the right word, but we are all part of that system. Um, so, I mean, let's, uh, let, let's start with that, that question of, of what is racism as you define it? So the working definition that I use for racism is racial bigotry that is supported by systems of power. And so what what um, um, tease that out for us, if you could, I mean, what um, uh, what it, what would not be racist in the context of the United States? So in the context of the of the United States, me saying something like, you know, I don't feel comfortable around white people is not racist. Uh, it may be a racial bigotry or a racial bias, but there's no real system of power that reinforces that or feeds off of that. And I'm not reinforcing a system of power with that statement as well. So, you know, me saying that I might ruin the day of a white person who hears me, right? but I'm not really feeding into a system or a culture that says that people shouldn't feel comfortable around white people. You know, it's not going to impact a white person's ability to get a job or, you know, to be accepted into a school or to be accepted into social groups. And, and that's where that difference lies. Is, is in the, is, is inherent to, or the, the power dynamic is a, uh, a necessary element of, the, of that dynamic. 
Yes. And for me, it's necessarily necessary, not because I just feel like we need to have arbitrary differences, right? Or because I necessarily feel that one in the moment feels worse than the other. But because when we're looking to solutions to the problems that show up in people's lives because of racism, we have to add that element. Because when we look at how racial bias plays out in the lives of different Americans, it plays out very differently for white people than it does for people of color. And the system of power is why. So if you're looking at talking about race and racism because you want to be able to solve the problem, you know, and you want to be able to, you know, make it so that the outcomes of of life for people of color are different than they are right now, then you have to look at where the impact actually is. And the impact is where these behaviors and these beliefs interact with our systems, with our education system, our criminal justice system, our economic system, our government. You know, that's where we need to look at it. And that's why it's important to see the system of power. It's not because, you know, people of color just want to have racism all to themselves. You know, it's because when we're looking at solutions, you have to know where the issue lies and where the hurt and the pain and the harm is done in order to be able to solve it. Right. I mean, so at the end of the day, it it, it really does not as a uh, as a white guy, as someone who has uh, access to all the things that uh, that a white male has in our society. I uh, frankly, I'm not going to be inhibited by having access to those things, uh, regardless of of um, how uh, how elements of the black community think about white people it's just not going because they don't necessarily have the levers of power correct and chances are you probably go through most of your day not having a clue of how black people in general feel about you because it doesn't matter in your day-to-day life right Uh, it might matter how a personal friend feels about you you know (laughs) or if you have any family members of color but you could wander around and you know if you walk next to a black person they could be thinking awful things about you does not doesn't have any impact on your day but for my day because i live in a white society because you know my bosses tend to be white my editors tend to be white my the people who you know sign my checks tend to be white the people in my government my son's teachers it matters all the time to me i constantly have to know what they're thinking about me what they're feeling about me because that impacts my ability to get through life and and you as um as a uh, a woman of color as opposed to just you specifically um as uh, i mean right i mean this we're, we're talking about uh, uh the way that we perceive um uh, members of, of 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 other races when we talk about this um so all right so let me you know and i probably should have started with this but i mean who is this book for and how much sort of good faith does someone have to have to be open to this argument that despite the fact that you feel you're not racist um you don't necessarily um have total control over that as much as uh, you know until you reckon with with how much of the system you are is that a fair way to put it Yeah, I think, you know, I think what I part of what I wanted this book to do was to separate intention from impact. I do think that you must have good intentions to be able to come to this book and read it. You know, I definitely wrote this for people who are coming to it in good faith, who, you know, perhaps think they're doing a good job or maybe have a sense they're not doing the best job in having these discussions, but they want to do better. And that's for people of all races, because the truth is, is that we all kind of come from the same systems, right? We all have the same education systems. I mean, there are definite differences on quality of education based on race, which is also included in the book, but we all kind of come from the same dialogue that doesn't equip us to have good conversations about race. You know, we don't come up in school learning how to talk about systemic oppression. And so even if you are facing it, if you're a person of color, chances are, you know, deep in your bones that something is very wrong. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you've been given all of the tools you need to be able to have discussions about it. And chances are, if you're white, you might know something's wrong, but you certainly will most likely not know to the extent and the role that you are playing in it. And so I definitely didn't 
write this book for people who don't believe racism exists, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or who, you know, are perfectly happy with the ways in which they participate with racist systems. I wrote this for people who want change. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be easy for them to read through the book. Um, it doesn't mean that they're going to be able, it's going to be easy to sit and recognize yourself perhaps in some of the descriptions of harmful behavior. But I'm hoping that, you know, your that people's concern and love for humanity and, you know, concern for the outcomes for people of color in this country and people's love of justice will get them through it and, you know, do that painful self-examination that's needed sometimes. I mean, is that, um, I mean, what is that uh, r reluctance? I mean, I, I mean, I guess, you know, look, so nobody likes to do too much self-examination uh, because sometimes maybe we're afraid of what we're going to find. But I mean, what is it in this specific instance is, is that reluctance? Because um, uh on one hand, I think that, you know, we can it, it would be easy to get um, the the cohort of people who are going to read your book. Right. Like those people who are interested in uh, social justice, who um, ha are coming to the question of uh, with good faith, uh, but aren't necessarily conscious of how what they do plays into uh, the systemic problems we have in terms of race around the country. The, those people would all agree that, let's say, I don't know, I mean, I think uh, they would agree that Donald Trump is, um, is racist. Uh, they would agree that, um, let's say, uh, Richard Spencer, right? Let's make this easy, mm -hmm. is, is racist. Um, it, what is it... I mean, is the difficulty with the idea of like, oh, my God, you can't label me in the same category as those people. And and are you um, arguing that that um, someone like myself who may not be conscious of all the elements of where I have privilege uh, or what, uh, what, you know, I'm not even aware of what I'm not aware of um, mm -hmm. I mean, w am I in that same category? Is are the categories too broad? I mean, what, uh, talk about that dynamic because I think that's, um, I mean, that's at the, that's why I think people. Uh, my sense is that's why where you get a lot of like reluctance for people to sort of like be open to that argument. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of pain avoidance when it comes to talking about race. And I think it's important to, to understand a couple of things. One, the way in which we think about race and racism and racists is by design. Because when we think about why the system of race was created, it wasn't created because white people in power had a general you know, anim animosity toward people of color. It was an economic system that needed a population to exploit. And it's an easy classification when you have people that you can go and by force steal and then say that their differences, their physical differences, uh, mean that they're meant for this work. But it, it had nothing to do with people going, gosh, I have this long grudge against Africans. Let me go find them you right. know, and make right. them slave. And we have to remember that, that it was not, I know this sounds weird, but it wasn't personal, right? It wasn't personal. And what happens then is, of course, they were able to exploit human nature's need to define an other and to make an enemy and to outline clearly who's you and who's them. And they exploited that to keep that economic system. Where the harm is done and was done even then is within that system, right? That defines your legal rights, that defines, you know, your humanity and who gets represented, who counts as human, who counts as a citizen. And that system is what still does the harm today. But when we look at what was, you know, the bad guys, what the real racists were, we didn't ever, even in the beginning, look at the people who were upholding the system, right? We didn't look at the businesses that profited from slavery. You know, we didn't look at the houses that were built off of slavery. What we looked at was who was holding the whip, who was saying the slur. And when we got rid of the people holding the whip, and then when we got rid of the people, you know, riding around in their KKK outfits and lynching people, and then, you know, when we got rid of the neo-Nazis, and then we, we like to pretend like that was where the problem lied, but the system remained.
and people continue to interact with the system. But the only imagery that we've been given when we talk about the horrors of slavery are not the real mundane horrors, which is, you know, going to your doctor because you have chest pains, but your doctor doesn't think black people feel pain the way white people do when they send you home and you die of a heart attack, right? That's the real horror of racism that most like black Americans face, you know, and we never looked at it as that way. We always looked at it as you were going to be dragged from your house and lynched. But even, you know, in those times, the bigger fears were, I'm never going to be able to feed my family because I can't get work, or I'm going to want, you know, wind up in prison, or my children are going to be treated horribly in school and they're not going to be able to finish and they won't have a future. You know, those everyday things that stop you from having any sort of quality of life. And because that imagery has always been, the racists are the people on horseback who are going to lynch your family, and then everyone else are good people who are shocked and appalled by that behavior. And no one has ever talked about from the beginning of how it's been the system that has been terrorizing people, and it's our interactions with the system. That means that suddenly when it's 2017 and it's 2016, and you have the majority of white voters voting for open racists, and you're like, but wait a minute, I thought we got rid of the people on horseback. I thought we got rid of all of this. What do you mean? But, you know, I was writing in 2015 about the fact that black households were making 13 times, you know, had 13 times less net worth than white households. That's terror. Right. That's starvation. That's, you know, that's complete insecurity. That's the inability to ever be able to climb out of a hole, not just for you, but for your children and your grandchildren. But, you know, suddenly people are looking around and going, what's the problem? And that, and it's the fact that we haven't defined it forever <laughs> the way it should be that makes it really hard then for people to reconcile what they've always thought is the real terror with what really is. And and. I mean, and so, OK, so the um, if the if uh, racism in this country was a function of needed needing to create a narrative around why you could own other people and own their labor. And essentially, I mean, we've uh, on this program, I, I think, have had uh, multiple interviews with people who have written uh quite extensively on uh, the importance of cotton and and how it uh, essentially uh, built the economy, not just in the South, but also in the north of this country. Um, and the if 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 the if racism was at least in part in this country um, and maybe even largely driven by that need to uh, commodify um, a, a group of people, what happens once i mean where how does what is the relationship between um uh, economics and and race in that regard today i mean are we just living off of the fumes like the the narrative was set and it's taken a life of its own uh because uh or, or does it still have a class element to it um, there's there's a mix of both. I think one we have to understand that as a society now we have kind of gotten used to seeing that the people who will profit from our society are white people, and black people won't. Right? We're used to thinking that um, it, so long as everyone's kind of improving at the same rate, everything's okay. But if black people start making gains, that means that something's being taken from white America. And I see this a lot. You know, we talk, uh, um, even here in Seattle, when we were talking about raising minimum wage, talking how this would help a lot of people of color. I heard from a lot of middle class, upper class white people saying, well, I'm going to get a raise too then, right? Because they wanted to make sure they were still making the same amount above, because to them, that's the way things should be. They should be making this much more. And when we look at, you know, who we define as the people who should be successful and what and and we have whole systems around that right when you have business that's defined around whiteness as it was from the beginning of slavery then what we you know define as professional goes around whiteness right, right. what we define as you know well, well we explain that because I, you touch on that i think in, in the context of 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 your hair uh, but I mean, mm-hmm. it, it, just expand on that for folks so that people understand, you know, the 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 supposed professionalism and decorum are, in fact, infused with, you know, that are, are 
I guess people like to think are sort of like quasi merit based are in fact, you know, sort of rigged on some level. Yes, I still get, I regularly get emails from white people who think that they can harm me by writing that I have awful hair, that my hair looks, you know, quote unquote crazy and no one's going to ever take me seriously if I don't change my hair. The hair that, you know, I'm wearing that grows out of my head. Um, (laughs) And when I was younger and I needed to get a job, you know, I used to have to pour burning chemicals that would literally break my hair apart to take the curl out. My head would be bleeding. I still have scars on my scalp from doing this every month. My head would bleed for about a week and a half afterwards. It would scab over. And then I would take a hot comb and burn it straight. It would break off at the ends. But this was considered professional. And we still have courts, you know, just this week, we had courts saying that it's completely fine for companies to uh, ban dreadlocks locks for and say that those are unprofessional right these are things that you know black hair does naturally and so when you think of like how and also how people speak you know i i definitely remember hearing commenters you know that would interview black people i hear them come out walking and say you know what he keeps saying axe axe isn't a word instead of ask and they would just discount that person and say they're unprofessional because they were speaking you know, the dialogue of their neighborhood, they were speaking the way, you know, that black Americans speak from certain neighborhoods. But if a white person were to come in with a country accent or some slang, you know, a twang, they wouldn't say, oh, he's not speaking professionally, he doesn't get the job. Um, You know, all of these sorts of things, I was constantly aware, I couldn't be when I was working because of my blackness, it was assumed that anytime I got excited, I was angry. So I couldn't, you know, even push back against things I knew were wrong that may even be harmful to the company, really, without people going, whoa, 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 calm down, you know, don't get all sassy on me. Uh, You know, I had friends who had their hair in braids. Um, I had a friend actually who had had his hair braided up. And then he was late one day and his boss pulled him aside and said that he didn't like his new attitude. And all that had changed was he had braided his hair. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and happened to be late, but he he put two and two together and decided, you know, he was suddenly developing an attitude. You know, I I was told, you know, when I did start to go natural, there were a lot of comments, and some people were like, "What's this new ethnic turn turn you're taking with your look?" You know, <laughs> but you know, I'm that's sorry how to laugh, but it may be yes, it's. <laughs> The, it's 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 funny and it's 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 exhausting and it's everywhere and even as a writer you know i grew up in seattle so you know um i like to joke sometimes i speak very fluent white people i grew up here um but when i see the way editors treat me and my work versus black people who speak with more av um you know suddenly they're less intelligent they have less to say but the arguments they're making the insight they have is amazing and they're speaking to an audience that exists you know so why would their writing be less relevant than mine you know and and those sorts of things you know the way in which we define you know success all of the time and we look at and it definitely shows in you know studies that show that if you write you know Jamal Washington on a job application you're four times less likely to get called for an interview than if you put down Adam Smith and you know that our whole society we don't even realize that everything that we've grown to expect what we what we decide is beautiful what we decide is intelligent you know there's studies that show that if you show someone a picture of a dark-skinned black person and a light-skinned black person they will assume the light-skinned black person is more intelligent and if you give them proof that a dark-skinned person is actually more intelligent and then ask them what you thought of their skin tone they will say that they're lighter skin than they actually are that's how insidious it is um and people don't know that that's what they're playing into it's not because they wake up in the morning saying how can i you know uh, ostracize black people there's so many people i know have no have no idea that many of the things they expect are steeped in white supremacy and you know they're not setting out to do these things but it doesn't mean because they don't mean to that doesn't make the harm any less you know, and when I go to a job interview, if I go with my natural hair and then I leave and someone's thinking I'm not professional, but they don't, they're not doing it. They don't think they're doing it because I'm black. They don't know that their definition of professional was set by white supremacy. That doesn't, you know, that's still not going to pay my bills. You know, right. It's still not going to help my family. And I think that 
it's important to understand how easy it is to absorb these things. These things are absorbed not only by white people, but also by people of color. Right. I was it just going to say it less OK. You know? I, I mean, that I think there's there's a lot of data out there. And I, I, I the, the the studies, uh, the specific authors of the studies escape me at the moment. But there's a lot of um, of data out there that show um, not only do, for instance, like white people um, uh, overestimate the uh, percentage and uh, the participation of uh, of black people in uh, things like Medicaid uh, that that black people do, too. I mean, they have been um, uh, in, in many respects just as, as, as steeped or I guess as steeped in this um, uh, the system of white, uh, white supremacy that um, they buy some of those narratives as well. Yes, and it's it's incredibly internally poisonous, you know, as well, because you don't necessarily have the power to change a lot of that narrative, even if you wanted to. But we grew up with much of the same messaging. So imagine growing up thinking you are going to be poor and there is nothing to be done about that. And you will never accomplish what other people accomplish. There is nothing to be done about that. And quite often the opposite is what white people are told. White people are constantly told that if they're poor, they're, they're just momentarily poor and it will change. And they can do absolutely anything they set their mind to. And you know everything is better than it is. And a lot of that shows in how white people vote. And for black people, we're told the opposite constantly. And to fight that, to fight that when it's all that you've ever been told in your school and your cult, in your pop culture. And, and then, you know, people are trying actively to reinforce that and how they treat you is very tough because you may have a lot of promise, but you're also using a lot of energy to prove yourself to people right. and to yourself all of the time. And I think a lot of people don't understand how it's not just somebody said something to me and I felt bad. It's I'm trying to do my best work and I'm stumbling over 20 different ways in which people are trying to make me prove that I belong here or telling me I don't belong here, you know, <laughs> or, or building systems that don't support me, you know, and I'm fighting all of that while also trying to be who I would be if I weren't so, you know, encumbered. And I think that we have to understand the amount of labor that takes. Even, you know, going through, um, you know, even for me writing my book, every single person in the process of writing my book that I dealt with was white. And so when you're writing a book on race and everyone in the process is white, you spend a lot of time translating. <laughs> right. I was going to say, there's nobody who you don't have to sort of walk through uh, certain aspects of it, I would imagine. There's exactly. no one who who understands from the get go. Um, yeah, yeah, that's um, and and they're trying to make my book better, right? So you know, I'm working with people who are trying to make my work better, working their hardest to make my work better, but they're honestly the same audience I would be writing to. And you're, you know, and so that means I do in, in the end get a little less of that than other people do, right. because. You know, they're not going to they're there. I have to catch them up first. Um, and I was quite lucky, actually, because I have a lot of black writer friends who have much tougher times. I was very lucky in my team um, that I didn't have as many struggles as they had. But still, just that basic fact that I'm starting from scratch, you know, right. um, and, and a lot of people in, in their day to day life. That's what it's like. You start and there's so much more you have to explain and so many more hurdles you have to jump over just to get through your day. Well, I, I mean, I've told this story probably uh, ad nauseum on the show, but uh, years ago I, I worked on a uh, black sitcom. And um, I've retold the story of uh, one of the guy's friends who had driven into a parking lot after us as we went into this underground parking lot, and he was driving a, a Range Rover out in L.A. And he pulled in. He's like, thank God you were here. I was getting followed by the cops again. So it was like the fourth time he had been pulled over in two weeks and for driving a Range Rover <laughs> and being yeah. black. And he had uh, said that he had called the the police department to see if he could get a sticker or something. And they basically just said, no, sorry. And just uh, I, I remember at that moment thinking, like, I can barely get through the day if I had to worry about every time I drove my car. Uh, that I was going to be apprehended, uh, I, I, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be able to leave the house. Um, yeah. And uh, so I, 
All right, so let me let me let me just ask a couple of just specific uh, questions that you do cover in the the book. Um, uh, w- one that I find I think you know m- many people, despite uh, their intentions and the way that they perceive themselves um, uh, on these questions of race, um, wonder how they talk about uh, affirmative action. Like how, how you know I I mean it's it's not it's. It is uh, not uncommon to find people who uh, otherwise feel that they're uh, fairly, um, you know, progressive when it comes to to race. Say some inhibitions about affirmative action. Yes, (laughs) it's interesting, too, because when you look at who affirmative action benefited, it was white women, most of all. Um, I think it's really important, first of all, for people to understand. I think a lot of the problems people have with affirmative action is first off i think it's really disconcerting to understand how much bias still lives every single day in our major institutions like education and employment right so we really do still have rampant teacher bias we still have testing bias we still have hiring bias and promotional bias um these things show in the numbers still you know and if you look from preschool on teachers are biased against black and latinx kids and and also indigenous kids there's not a lot of studies done on that but pretty much all of them show that yes they're just as biased against indigenous kids as well Um, oftentimes also pacific islander kids depending on the geography Um, so from preschool on our children are labeled as violent, as aggressive, and as unintelligent. And from that system, we're expecting them to rise all the way through, to take tests that are oftentimes designed for a culture that they are not a part of, for an experience they don't have, especially when you look at you know SAT questions and things like that, um, and and for an edu- you know a history history books that don't show them and don't appeal to them, and right. you know all of these things, and they're dealing with this throughout the entire time and fighting the entire school to prison pipeline. And then they apply to college and the same bias of their name showing up and their neighborhood showing up. Because when we look at how school funding, you know, um, impacts children of color, especially for models that are based on income tax, like in Washington state where I live, um, you know, you're looking at colleges then who are saying, oh, not this neighborhood. We don't get the best kids, quote unquote, from this neighborhood. Right. Um, And then they're supposed to get in there and then they go into college and they're seeing the exact same thing with their professors as far as what they're reading. It's a majority white professor base with very few, um, you know, very few, very few resources for children of color to integrate and flourish and to help them along. Um, And they get through that entire process and then they're in the job market and it starts all over again. This is still the reality for people of color. Right. That they're less likely to be hired, they're less likely to be chosen, they're more likely to be paid less when they are. So that's already the reality. And then we have to add to that the historical debt. And I'm not talking about you owe people because it's like you owe, you know, in this cosmic sense. I'm talking about the fact that if your grandfather was not able to get a job, then he was unable to save money and buy property. And that meant he had nothing to pass to your father. And that meant that your your mother and your father had nothing to pass to you, right? And right. you're already starting behind. And so when we look at affirmative action, affirmative action is not necessarily to, I don't think it's the thing that's going to fix systemic racism. But what it will do <laughs> is it will kind of stem some of the bleeding we have right now from hundreds of years of imbalance. It's a, it's a um, band-aid. We, I mean, it's a band-aid. Yeah, it is. And, but it's needed. You know, like people like to dismiss band-aids. <laughs> but right. the truth is this, you still need a band-aid. We, we need long-term solutions, right? We need to address all of this crucial bias. But at the same time, we also need to make sure that people of color are hired and paid equal wages and that they're getting into colleges, um, regardless of whether or not the staff wants to hire them. Right, and, and you know, and that's that's what affirmative action really does. And 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 uh, you you mentioned the the income disparity. There's also an even greater wealth disparity. Uh, and as people know, um, home ownership is the primary uh, driver of intergenerational wealth. And uh, on top of all of the 
um, the liabilities that uh, uh, black folk have had in trying to uh, increase wealth over generations. The, the U.S. government itself over the years, as recently as, you know, uh, the, the New Deal and uh, uh, mortgage backed loans, uh, were redlining and were preventing um, uh, black families from uh, accumulating wealth. I mean, so it's, it's the, the, the debt there is, is real. Um, yeah, and it's, <laughs> it's definitely real. And it, even, even if you're able to get out of something like that, so like, even if we forget, like, even if we're not looking at redlining or even neighborhood covenants, which continued well into right. some of the two thousands, right. That kept people of color out of neighborhoods. If you look at the fact that even with this last, you know, housing crash that we had, we found that the predatory loans all went to people of color. The yep. people first impacted were people of color. Color, right. Even if you had people of equal credit standing, banks would try to take advantage of them. And then we also show, though, that even if you are able to buy a house, just the fact that you are a black person in a house living in a neighborhood with more minority people means that your house is going to gain a slower value and you're going to get less return on your investment anyways. So no matter what, it's like a losing. There's really almost nothing right now in the current system <laughs> that people of color can do to kind of bypass that. And so when you look at, yeah, what people can hand down, I, I bought my house. I'm the first person, you know, my mom does not own a house. Um, and I'm so fortunate that I did. I'm the only member of my family right now who has that. And my mom is being priced out of everything she has. You know, my brother's got rising rents and, I, I look at, I don't know a single, I don't have another single personal black friend of mine who owns a home. Wow. Um, well, let, so lastly, let me ask this. In, I mean, what is the, the value of m people having this greater awareness as individuals and being able to sort of be, um, I guess, Maybe more empathetic is the right word or have a just a, a greater consciousness of how they contribute to uh, systemic white supremacy, how they benefit from systemic white supremacy, depending on their race, how they um, maybe they get a, a, a more systemic uh, insight or in, as to how they are disadvantaged by white uh, supremacy. But what is the advantage of of that relative towards changing the system. I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to be wall, wallflowerish about it. I mean, but where, where is the, the, the theory of, of change from a political standpoint? I actually think that's probably the most important question, right? What we need to realize is that our privilege, our unexamined privilege, those are choices we don't know we're making. So you go through your life and you don't quite realize that you're choosing to interact with these systems in a particular way. You think you're just going along with things, but that's still a choice. When you become aware, then you get to make different choices. And part of the reason why I, the main reason why I want people to go through these, these painful exercises, right, of realizing what may seem kind of mundane at first, all these um, small ways that they may be contributing to these systems is because those are times where they have the ability to change how they contribute or to stop contributing. And that's actually where the real power for the system is. A lot of people think we have to start at the top, right? That maybe if we got rid of Trump, Right. That it would, you know, and granted, it would it'd be wonderful if I could wake up tomorrow and we didn't have Trump. <laughs> it would be it would be wonderful. But Trump was elected by people. Right. And he's empowered by a Congress. And these things, you know, start, you know, these people get their start in city council. And, you know, what they're what they expect is groomed in our school, which means that if you're not aware of, you know, the privilege that you have to vote in your school board and the power that the school board has if you're not aware of how the school system upholds it, oppression against people of color and how it's you know one of the main pipelines leading many black youth into prison if you're not aware of that um it doesn't mean that you don't have the choice it means that you're neglecting 
make that decision. You're choosing to not show up at that vote and ask people, you know, in the school board, what are you going to do about your um, opportunity gap for children of color? What what are your suspension rates in the district? What are you going to do to get police officers out of these schools that are, you know, dragging black and brown children into juvie. Uh, you know, when you're looking at those little things, when, you know, um, someone knocks on your door and they want your vote for city council and you're not asking them what they're doing about police reform, what they're doing about imp- improving the infrastructure in poor neighborhoods. You know, these things every day, if you're sitting in an officer in, in a manager's meeting at work and you're looking around and everyone around you is white and you're asking, where's the, you're not asking, where's the diversity in this meeting? Or you're not asking HR what their policies are to handle racial discrimination or issues of racism in the office, then you are neglecting that duty. That duty doesn't go away, though. You're just making a choice. And that's also, more often than not, a a function of the privilege you have of it not really directly impacting you in many instances. And (laughs) Um, uh, because it's not, the stakes are just simply not as high. Um, all right, let me, I, I, that, I meant that to be my last question, but I had one more, um, as you were talking about Trump and that is, I'm curious as to your perspective on, um, Obama's, um, uh, relationship, uh, or I guess addressing of, uh, systemic white supremacy in this country. It's specifically, um, the, his, from my perspective, he often leaned quite a bit on respectably uh, respectability politics and uh, spoke very often about individual responsibility. I think he had a program, My Brother's Keeper, at one point uh, it, when addressing the black community. What, what's your perspective on that? You know, I think that I think that many I think many black people, including me, we saw very clearly a man who was working within a system. Um, there were definite times where I was very upset. And I still don't, I still think that just like I think with every president, they're always going to be fully responsible for the choices they make, no matter how tough those choices are. Um, and so I can honestly say, you know, there were times when he would speak after a shooting and I would be like, look, I know that you think that you're trying, <laughs> but this yeah. isn't enough. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, and it would be frustrating, but I also know that it would actually be hard. It would, he, it was harder for him to say anything than it would have been for a white president. Right. And we see the opposite of this now, right? We see Trump saying absolutely ghastly things about people who are subjected to violence like this, and no one bats an eye. Um, but, you know, Obama couldn't even talk about being a black man without it becoming, you know, all of this talk about is he a president for black people or is he a president for America? So I recognize he was in a really tough situation. Um, And I do think that I think he could have done more. (laughs) And I also think that as the American people, we definitely could have done more, especially the first couple of years he was in office to empower and support him to do more. Um, But I also think that he, a lot of the compromises he made had some very disastrous um, consequences, especially when they look at immigration policy that are inexcusable. You know, there's, you can't get, you can't put those families back together. Um, and that, you know, people want to kind of give him leeway on and I won't, but there's also a reason, you know, I look at, I look at Obama and I look at what he tried to do. I look at how much it aged him, how much it took out of him and how every step of the way he was treated like public enemy number one for even attempting to show that he cared about black America. Um, and I know I will never run for politics <laughs> because I know that the freedom to do what I need to do isn't there. But I also think looking at, too, how little he was able to accomplish, even when he tried the slightest, how hard it was, I think shows how much we as people need to really take the power we have and start making it so that those that would hold our leaders back from being able to do these things are unable to or afraid to. The truth is, is that, you know, we had our House of Representatives, our, you know, our senators, they all felt safe in their jobs, making his job impossible. Right. You know, and our, our what we expected in cities on the city level may, meant that we didn't expect anything more nationally. And I think that that's where I would love there to be more focus. I, I despise respectability politics. I'm not surprised at how often it came up in the Obama 
you know, administration. I don't think he could have survived as the president elsewhere. But I would have wished, especially perhaps the last couple of years, that he would have just gone for broke. But, you know, I can't. I didn't I didn't sit in those shoes. And there's a reason why I would never, ever, ever put myself up for that job. And watching how he was treated through that and watching how limited he was in what he could do is, is the number one reason why. Idioma Aluo, uh, the book is So You Want to Talk About Race. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.